Good evening. Welcome to the Wednesday, November 14th, 2012 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, can we have the roll call? Chairman Lennon? Here. Councilor Gouvernelli? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Ray? Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. And Councilor Walsh? Here. Uh, can we have the roll? Oh, you just did the roll call. Join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance, Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Town Council reports and correspondence. It occurred to me, uh, when the town manager reminded uh, me about five minutes ago, that uh, this is Sarah Lennon's uh, last meeting as chair of the council, as well as her last meeting. Uh, Sarah has served in the council for six years, is the uh, senior member of our group, uh, and it has been my pleasure for the last four years to serve with Sarah on the council. Uh, for anybody who is new to this group, uh, as I was four years ago, uh, Sarah is uh, a mentor, uh, a cheerleader, a very supportive uh, person. I think after meetings where some issue might have been driving me crazy, I would call Sarah up the next day, basically to get a free therapy session. <laughs> um, uh, what really, I, I think, goes down to Sarah's major accomplishment over her six years in the council is really uh, buying into the one town concept for Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and and uh, in the past, there have, has been some uh, acrimony here and there between the council and the school board over various budget issues. But since we've had Sarah on the council, she's really uh, gone a long way to bridging that divide, uh, having the two bodies work together very effectively, and all for the good of our town. Uh, so in addition to all her service on the various committees over the last, last six years, I really view that as Sarah's major accomplishment. Uh, as chair of the council over the last year, I will say uh, that the meetings have uh, been a, a, a lot quicker uh, than they were when I was chair. Uh, Sarah has moved things all along at a good clip, but has also made sure that everybody's had an opportunity to have their say. Um, so on behalf of the council and the town of Cape Elizabeth, uh, it is my pleasure to present you a gift from the town in recognition <laughs> of your fine service on the council as well as as chair of the council. Thank you, David. On video. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. I have to say it's been um, a lot of fun, actually. People stop me now and ask me if I'm happy to be leaving, and I say, no, I'm actually sad. I'm going to miss everyone, and it's been great to work with you, and I've learned an enormous amount, and uh, I'll miss it. You'll probably see me lingering here in the crowd, <laughs> waiting to say something in between. So thank you very much. Um, so proceeding, since I have now 55 minutes to get us out of here, keeping with my record. Um, now is the time for uh, citizen. Sorry. Jeff, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Chair. I just had one item under correspondence, <clears throat> which isn't really a correspondence, but I would like to thank our town clerk, Deborah Lane, and her staff, who worked very, very hard and did a wonderful job running a very smooth election process from the outset with absentee balloting all the way through to the wee hours on November 6th. Deborah, do you want to talk about that at all? 
I would. Thank you very much. It's a great, great segue. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone on our election staff for their exemplary work during the election. Um, last week ended many, many months of, of planning, um, although our deputy clerk, Jackie Coy, still continues to do reports and will be for the next several weeks, um, the most of it, it it's done. Um, by nature, elections are incredibly labor-intensive details. There's many elements to them. And we have a team of individuals and actually town and school departments that are all brought together um, to bring this election together. Um, our staff did a tremendous job. I'm so proud of each and every one of them. Just to give you an idea of kind of what we are up against or dealing with, the voter turnout was almost 80 percent, about 6,400, a little more than 6,400 voters. That's 12,800 ballots, not that we're counting. Um, of that, um, approximately 2,800 people voted by absentee ballot. Uh, 400 of those were over the electronic request system through the state. Um, on election day, we had over 275 new registrants alone. That did not include corrections to the list and people moving within town. Um, in terms of our staffing, there were 23 individual staff members and over 1,500 hours uh, were given to the election. That's not including my time. That's not including the gals in the tax office um, that certainly failed at questions and, and helped us as well. So um, I stopped calculating after 1,500 hours. To give you an idea of the all-encompassing work this takes with town and school support, um, again, it affects the town clerk's office, the tax office, assessing codes, planning office, the school central office, police and fire, public works, Thomas Memorial Library, the school facilities, and custodial staff. Um, again, all these resources coming together to serve our residents in the quality of service that you um, expect from us, and we are happy to deliver to you, um, and to certainly uphold the integrity of the electoral process. Um, we're proud to serve you in this regard, and again, I'm so proud of our team, and I thank each and every one of them. I was going to list them individually, but if I forgot someone in a department, I would feel horrible. So please forgive that. Um, but again, thank you for the time to thank them. Um, and we are glad it's over. <laughs> Until next time. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, now is the opportunity for citizens for any discussion or comments that are not on tonight's agenda. That might be you. Hello, my name is Mark Mayona, I'm the president of Spread Wing Road and Gun Club. I just wanted to give you an update of uh, where we were at. I know this isn't uh, connected with the workshop, but since we're going into our winter season, uh, things start to slow down quite a bit over at the, uh, at the club. Um, I've uh, gone ahead and formally hired a, uh, what's called a range technical training advisor. And uh, this is a person who, he, evaluates a range to uh, suggest improvements, uh, safety issues, uh, all encompassing as far as what he views as uh, uh, any range advice to us, whatever we could take. Um, so that's in the works. I uh, formally contacted him. I informally had previously contacted him just to make sure that he could do the evaluation uh, in a fairly prompt manner. From what I understand, uh, many ranges are actually trying to do this, uh, not only here, but nationally. So the amount of these people, uh, there's very few of them. Um, so he did agree to go ahead and uh, do it for us. So I'm hoping that uh, within the next uh, 14 days to 30 days, I should actually have a report from him uh, making suggestions to updating and modernizing our range. Uh, and let's see. Oh, and we are about 60% complete on putting in our uh, metal fence. And we're also re, uh, we're going to leave all the signage that we have up, which is considerable as it is now. We're going we're to actually also put more of it onto the uh, fencing itself. So uh, anyway, that's where we are. I just thought you'd like to know so we didn't have to 
you know, has left, uh, especially with the changeover and the leadership and council members, you probably want to just keep you up to speed. Thank you. I really appreciate your coming to give us that update. Does anyone have any questions? No? Great. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to seeing the report. Is that something that's public? Um, we'll have to decide that at a club level. Okay. Um, but we'll definitely, anyone who's been driving by the range has actually probably been noticing quite a lot of difference down there. So uh, we'll decide that at a later date at the club. But I definitely, the way it's going right now, we're actually in a good place. So. Good. With Thank our you. neighbors. Thank Good. you so much. Uh, town manager's report. Yes, thanks, Sarah. I, I want to join first in thanking Deborah and everyone involved in the election for uh, not only conducting election day, but the, the, all the time leading up to it as well. The absentee voting. Uh, you know, it was. I think it was probably. We always have smooth elections, but this one seemed to be the smoothest. So uh, everything really went well and showed a lot of preparation by a lot of folks. I also did want to acknowledge that. We, Sarah, uh, we'll miss you. Uh, all of the staff will and appreciate all you've done. We also have four other elected officials who will no longer be serving us, uh, you know, effective after the elections. Uh, Senator Snow, who we've worked with over the years for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, state Senator Cynthia Dill, who served on the council, served as a state representative, served as a state senator. Uh, Jane Everly, uh, who we've worked very closely with on quite a few issues, and Dick Feeney, who served on the county commission for many years uh, and has come to a number of meetings uh, over the years updating us on different county issues and appreciate uh, all of their efforts. I <laughs> also did want to mention uh, that Bruce Smith, our code enforcement officer, has uh, resigned effective the end of the week. Uh, he uh, has, was with us for 15 years. I think you know we all wish him well uh, in his future endeavors. I uh, know he has many admirers in the community who, who appreciate uh, uh, his service over the years and you know I join in, in wishing him well and just wanted to update you on that as well so thank you thank you um, review of the draft minutes from October 10th do I have a motion move to approve seconded discussion all those in favor um, okay, we are, uh, the next thing on our agenda is the short-term rentals, but Dave. Yeah, I, I'd like to make a motion that we, we consider taking item number 132 out of order. 132, it relates to the Robinson Woods 2 uh, issue that's before us tonight, and I anticipate that will be fairly quick, but I don't want to prejudge anything too much. Uh, so I would move that we take that out of order and consider that first before we go through the rest of the agenda. I'd second that motion. All those in favor? Okay, great. Um, so let's have a motion for 132. Did you want, um, well, make a motion and then there'll be an update? Yeah. Is that what you wish to do? That's right. Um, I, I move that the town council pursuant to its vote on June 13, 2011, hereby authorize the town manager to provide $350,000 to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust at closing for its acquisition of a 63 plus acre parcel known as Robinson Woods II. Accept the public access easement in the form deemed acceptable to the town attorney on October 29, 2012 and agrees to authorize the town manager to sign third party acceptance of a conservation easement over said parcel being granted by the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust to the Maine Coast Heritage Trust. Second. Mike, do you wanna? Yeah, uh, that should be, the, the current draft that you have before you is actually dated today uh, rather than the date back in October. So maybe the, the motion ought to address today's yeah, date. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what I was looking to you for. Yeah, it's essential that draft. The, the only change from the earlier draft to this one is that there was some concern expressed that, that it was limited to daylight use. Uh, the town has traditionally uh, had its own open spaces available to citizens, moonlight, uh, otherwise, you know, 24-7. Uh, uh, that issue was raised with the land trust this morning. Uh, they did agree to that change. The, the draft that you have it is uh, today does say daylight. 
in one place, but it didn't get caught in another. So in the, the purpose statement, it also needs to say daylight. So with that, the town attorney uh, does recommend that it be approved and uh, you know everything seems to be in order. So I amend my motion that the town, the acceptable to the town attorney on November 14th, 2012, correct? Today's date? Right. This has to be, I guess, seconded again, right? Second. Discussion? <clears throat> I, I'd just like to give a shout out to, to this moment because for me this is just a wonderful example of the town partnering with CELT to get something done that is for me, I think for most citizens, so exciting. Um, this is something that citizens have told us over and over in surveys and just informally that they love to preserve land and CELT did an, just an unbelievable job of stepping up and raising an incredible amount of money to make this happen. And the um, the parcel itself is amazing, and it's also um, special in that it connects uh, other parcels to form larger tracts of land for habitat and for passive recreation and people and completing the whole green belt around town. Um, I emailed Chris Franklin today just to ask him were there a few facts or interesting things, and he emailed me back something that I thought was so impressive, I just wanted to take a minute to read the whole thing. He says, in the 16 months, CELT raised $1.2 million from nearly 250 individual donors, foundations, and the town of Cape Elizabeth. The single largest donor is the town, whose $350,000 is an expression of their commitment to investing in the preservation of Cape's natural environment for public recreation and wildlife protection. The property itself is 63.6 .6 acres, comprising 12 acres of fields, five acres of ponds, and extensive high-value wetlands and woodlands. The property has exceptional habitat value, and its addition to Robinson Woods will create a 145 acre contigu contiguous parcel. The parcel also secures the protection of nearly a mile of the 7.5 mile cross town trail connecting Fort Williams to Kettle Cove. The project marks the near completion of securing public access to the entirety of the trail, first envisioned in 1974. In addition to preserving 70% of the trail that remained in private ownership, this project also facilitated the donation of a trail easement on adjacent lands owned by Kirk and Nancy John St. John Pond. With these acquisitions, there remains only two parcels along the entire, entire trail corridor that do not have permanent deed and public access. In addition to securing the funds necessary to pre preserve this remarkable property, CELT raised an additional 100000 to help fund the future stewardship of the property, conduct, to conduct natural resource surveys, and to fund trail and access improvements to the property. The four Robinson brothers selling the property were exceedingly accommodating throughout the negotiations, be beginning with their willingness to create a parcel specifically designed by CELT to, to encompass the majority of the high-value habitat on the property and the majority of the existing trail system, and subsequently with a pledge of 50,000 to support CELT's ongoing stewardship responsibilities. All of us itself are very appreciative and very proud to partner with the town to acquire and preserve this very valuable piece of land, Chris, Chris Franklin. So I would applaud both CELT and all of us for this, this great partnership. So, if there's, yeah. And I just uh, also appreciate the fact that a lot of board members from the Land Trust are here tonight. Uh, I want to in particular thank Ted Darling for all of his work on this project. It was a real pleasure working with him over the past year on this, as well as the rest of the members of the Board of Directors for the Land Trust. And it is a, definitely a feel-good vote for, for me uh, to, to see this happen. Sorry, uh, you know, again, I'd like to compliment Michael, you, David, and also to you, Frank, for your initial work meeting with the CELT and, and getting the initial parts of this all put together so we knew exactly what direction we were headed. also want to thank um, uh, Jessica for her uh, fine work on picking out the, the issue <laughs> about daylight versus other time. Uh, when I read that, I also noted that Jessica's name is in there because she wasn't a budding landowner at one time, so her name is actually in the deed, I guess. Uh, but again, I, I think this is, again, it's, a, it's one of those um, once-in-a-lifetime watershed sort of opportunities for the town, and I'm really pleased that we're able to do this. Great. All those in favor? <laughs> Unanimous. Okay. Backtracking to item 130, which is the short-term rental issue. Um, <clears throat> we have a public hearing. 
So I will open that public hearing now. And I, everyone, I'm sure, by now knows the rules. You come up here, you have three minutes, and let it begin. Good evening, friends. <laughs> Um, my name is Jennifer Aronson. I live at 27 Lawson Road. Compromise is going to be the only way we can move forward on this issue, and I support the short-term rental ordinance. I am surprised there's no language relating to sublessors, so I will say there is a big difference between a property owner renting their house and a sublessor renting Oceanside properties for the purpose of running a short-term <coughs> rental business. I don't know if you could please include language to address that difference. Uh, learning about the impact of the internet on our zoning regulations will be crucial for maintaining strong neighborhoods. Therefore, I think it would be fair and important to include a clause in the final draft of the short-term rental ordinance that mandates a formal review of the ordinance in one year's time. Thank you for your hard work on this very time-consuming issue. I promise I will stay in communication with this council as concerns arise. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyone else? My name is Peter Clifford. I live at 36 Lawson Road. I, too, want to thank the council for all the hard work. Uh, I definitely have more of an appreciation for what it's like just having watched you struggle with this issue and listening to all of us. So once again, thank you. Um, I want to echo what Jenny Aronson mentioned. Um, specifically, I had earlier given proposed language because I think I, I do agree that this is a compromise. We're not getting everything that we were hoping for, but we're getting something. And I think this will help us to live in a residential neighborhood. But I do strongly, I think it's critical that somebody attempting to run a business by getting into a lease agreement with an oceanfront property owner or other property owner for the primary purpose of subleasing that property for short-term rentals is just not in any way residential use. And that's the biggest single problem with, the, with this particular ordinance. So just for the record, uh, and uh, these changes are very, very, um, I think, simple. I've tried to keep it as, mi as minimal as I could. But in the definition section, uh, as I indicated in my October 10th email, the definition of short-term rental should include language as follows, quote, uh, it should say, use of a dwelling offered for rent, quote, by the owner of the property for transient occupancy by a tenant. So in other words, the definition of short-term rental, in my opinion, to eliminate business use needs to specifically state that the owner is the only one empowered to enter into a short-term rental, not a business person who's leasing this property. And the only other provision uh, is on the applicability section, which I think in this version is number 15. I think you absolutely need an express language to <clears throat> make it clear that business use, as I've described it, is prohibited. And it should say, quote, this is where, under the applicability section, the last sentence, only owners of the property may enter into a short-term rental agreement. Owners may not lease their properties to a third person for the purpose of permitting that person to engage in a business of managing short-term rental contracts. So I've advocated for this for a couple months now. Uh, I think, again, uh, business use is just not permitted in residential neighborhoods. And the, the problem with this ordinance is that it does seem to create uh, a business opportunity for people that is really ruining, or has at least threatens to ruin the neighborhood. Thanks again. I appreciate all your time. Thanks. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. 
How are you guys? Um, Patty Grennan, AT Barn Road. Um, I just want to take a couple of minutes. This has been um, a long, protracted process over the last 14 months. So I wanted to say thank you. Um, I, I'm hoping that tonight we can have some resolution on this. Um, and we spent a lot of time with um, the board, whether it be the planning board and the council and as well the ordinance committee. So I think there's been a lot of thought into this. Um, while it's not perfect, I think that um, as Pete expressed and some others that um, it's clearly a compromise. I think that um, people who rent their homes would rather not deal with any of this. You know, I can understand that. Um, while um, those who abut would rather not to see rentals, th this clearly is landing in between. Um, and what's good about that, in my mind, is that um, it addresses a couple different things. The first thing would be that um, for people who are currently renting, it sets up some some, some, some sort of parameters, and I'm sure they're not, at this point going forward, will not have any problem following, where you know, limits on numbers, that makes sense um, for small neighborhoods, limits on cars and things that were some of the things. Um, at the same time, as people, as some of the new houses that come up that people may just be getting the idea to rent, um, as homeowners who rented had said there's there's kind of a learning curve that goes along with and they've said, admitted that um, there won't be a problem there'll be clear things in place so people won't have you know buses pulling up or whatever else they'll know clearly that it's eight people and and you know eight people for guests um, and the last thing that if they're I'm sure that everybody um, hopefully will be good um, landlords going forward with renting their homes but if they're not there's things in place in this ordinance that allow um, over time um, to eliminate bad, um, bad, bad landlords. So um, for me, I would hope um, that we could, um, at this point, um, approve this as it is written, perhaps with an amendment or two, with some discussion tonight that Pete has um, said. But I, I, I would I'd love to see bring closure to this dialogue and, and move forward. So I want to thank you so much for your time and appreciate everything. Thank you, Patty. Anyone else? Jim Hubner, 13 Kettle Cove Road. I'm a landlord for a short-term rental. Um, I am not in favor of the ordinance. It is a compromise. I guess if the, uh, a good compromise is nobody's happy, maybe it's a good compromise. But I think the ordinance is not necessary. You'll notice that all the comments that I can remember have been about Lawson Road at one house. Those problems have been addressed. As far as I know, there's been no other problems. Um, you may pass this ordinance, but I think the net result in a year from now is one or two of the neighbors on Lawson Road is going to have the police on speed dial. When anybody in that house so much as flushes the toilet, they're going to be calling the police in the hopes they think they can get some substantiated <coughs> complaints. I predict that they won't, but they will make themselves such a nuisance to the police that the police will suggest that the neighbors and the owner go to mediation to work out their differences. That's probably what should have been done to begin with. The practical effect on the rest of the landlords in town where there have been no problems, we've got to fill out some forms, got to pay a fee, got to take in a couple hours off to whoever the new court enforcement officer is, comes over, inspects, tells us, what we, tells us what we already know because our insurance companies already make us have all those things. So it's unnecessary. It's, it's a burden on our time. And then we go about our business and nothing's changed because there have been no problems except for that one house which has been addressed. A few years from now, because you're not really going to be able to enforce these ordinance, ordinances except on Lawson Road because those, there's bad blood there and there's nothing and we can do about that. But a few years from now, they'll be forgotten. Whatever permits are will lapse because there's nobody there going to enforce it. So that, except on Lawson Road. That's my prediction. So to get back into what I originally said, I think it's an unnecessary ordinance because whatever goals you had, it, it really, you're trying to control behavior and it doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, I'm Sandy Dunham, and I live at uh, 11 Becky's Cove Lane, and I have a rental property at 12 Becky's Cove Lane, and y'all have heard from me from for this whole process. And I'm not too overly enthusiastic about filling out all those forms and paying a fee and what have you. However, I just, um, uh, a couple of things I wanted to say that I do support putting in some sort of language about the sub subletting. Um, and I, I do support that because I think that can cause issues and problems. And that um, uh, we should do that. Um, and the other thing, the other um, thing is, oh, I wanted to know what, how are you going to set a fee and what is the fee going to be? When we first started this process, we were told, oh, no fees, there would not be any fees. This is just a reporting kind of thing. And the other thing was, um, uh, the way it's written now, it limits properties 30,000 square feet or under to eight people, um, no matter how big the house is, which is in some instances will be less than two people per bedroom. Um, and it didn't, I, in the beginning, we were, that's what we were talking about, um, two, having two people per uh, bedroom for the limit of the number of people. Um, but I wanted to thank the committees um, for your work on this, and hopefully um, it will uh, improve uh, the issues and the problems on Lawson Road. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. Hi, um, June Eisen, um, 117 Old Ocean House Road. I really want to be done with this just as much as everybody else. <clears throat> I do agree that there should be a sublet restriction um, as I don't see them as being as concerned about neighborhoods as owners are. Um, <clears throat> I feel that I've always tried to rent conscientious to the preservation of the neighborhood and my property. Um, I do still feel that the ordinance as it stands is not quite ready for implementation. I personally have an issue with the three strikes protocol. Um, as a landlord, I have a binding agreement with my tenant. It outlines restrictions on occupancy and will also now include town noise and nuisance parking and fireworks regulations. If my tenant violates this agreement, I can immediately <clears throat> excuse me, evict them and keep their security deposit. The way the protocol is currently written, it may be up to a week before I'm even notified that the police have visited my property. I don't find that acceptable. If the police are visiting my property because there's a complaint, I want to get called ASAP, not, not a week from now in writing. Um, because then my tenant may already be gone. I have no recourse. Um, and my next tenant, who's not guilty, is checked in and everything's good. Um, if I am found guilty, so to speak, of I, an, an offense there, um, I may lose my permit for 30 days. This will force me to break legal rental agreements with unrelated tenants, and this is hardly fair to someone expecting to have a place to stay in Cape Elizabeth. And I will be responsible for any suit brought against me for breach of contract all because I was unfortunate with the tenant's behavior, which I cannot control. I can screen to the best of my ability, but there are bad eggs, and eventually you will get a bad egg. I, it's just Murphy's Law. Um, I would see it maybe better to assess at the end of the rental season whether a renewal is going to be granted. Um, I don't believe anybody is going to rent outside of the guidelines of this proposal. Um, if the tenant has someone over that's there after 11 o'clock because they're watching a movie and they're not making any noise, is that, should that really be considered a violation and they're spending the night? I don't think so. You need, I, sorry, you need to wrap up. It's been oh, sorry. Um, and I thought there was to be no subletting. And the other thing um, was this uh, safety codes. Um, spoke with Richard Strel Steller of South Portland, who's acting code enforcement officer. And the uh, IBC codes that are noted, fire extinguisher and egress illumination, 
are codes for public buildings, and they don't, don't, do not apply to single or two-family residences. And um, he indicated to me that they would be difficult to implement in a single-family dwelling because they, they don't speak to single-family dwellings. Um, Sorry, I, I got to... You got to stop. It's yep. three minutes. Okay. That's thank you. Those are my issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no one else, I assume no one else. I will close the public hearing, um, and we will consider. So, why don't we begin with a uh, motion? Jessica. Well, I. Jessica, did you want to? No, you go ahead. I, doesn't, I mean, basically, I'm going to, um, I have a long, this motion is whereas, it's quite a lengthy one. Do you want okay. to say as set forth in our packets, or does she, he need to read the whole thing? It's up to you. Why don't you just say? So I, I yeah, I move that uh, the proposed motion to adopt short-term rentals ordinance provisions as included in our packet with, um, with the, Seven or eight paragraphs, whereas, which uh, clarify where we're headed. Um, that's my motion. Second. Second. Jim, as chair of ordinance, do you want to say a few words here? Or? Well, I, we got more accolades, frankly, tonight than we've received in 14 months, and I appreciate, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. And, and I think the best thing about this, I mean, the, we're all citizens. We're all trying to do the right thing, everybody here. Um, and it's, it's been an interesting process. I've learned a lot along the way. Um, the two issues, I, I wondered if, um, if Jenny had read um, Tom Leahy's response to one of your suggestions about substantiated issues. Had you read his, it was online? I did not. You didn't, read it. okay. And, and then um, in addition to that, we also had uh, Mr. Clifford, you had your issue was also addressed by Tom at our last meeting, and that was online. Did you read that, by any chance? Uh, I did speak to Tom. And I did you read it? It was a note, a letter that was on the website. One minute to take it. Okay. Well, let, let's. Uh, you know, might as well, for the sake of clarity, would you? Are you? Is I'll, I'll look to the council's direction on this for clarity. I think it would be helpful for them to know that we did we did address both of those from the last meeting. And it was also mentioned by other uh, folks giving testimony today. So let me just get to uh, Tom's, uh, Tom's note. And again, remember, Tom is counsel for the, for the town, and we, we fully vetted the question. And Tom came back, uh, and actually was a meeting that we held with him, came back and recommended to the ordinance committee. Uh, and let me just uh, read the paragraph that addressed the current draft does not adopt a suggestion made by a resident that the town prohibit the entering of a short-term rental agreement by anyone other than the record title holder of the property. And that was what was brought up to us the last time. It appears to me, this is his opinion now, it appears to me that it is the use of the property and the activity upon that property that is being regulated under these provisions. And whether a short-term rental should be allowed or not should not turn on whether a family member or a senior citizen or an agent for a serviceman or anyone else on duty for an extended period of time or a lessee or an agent for that record owner should be de the determining factor. My view is that the town should regulate what happens with the property, not who signs the contract, but that is my simple way of looking at the question. So he addressed this very issue felt very, you know, very strongly about that in a meeting that was held with him. And we went back to the ordinance committee and opted not to add any further sort of definition. The second question was Jenny's question about, uh, and actually I think Patty Grennan also brought this up, and that was the issue about taking the three strikes component and, and, and possibly making it even stiffer if one were to lose one's right, the second time you come back into the market to do a rental, there would be a new set of standards for that person. And again, that suggestion on the continued violations be stronger, um, he, hasn't, he didn't believe that we should make a change to that draft, calling for the suspension of, of one year after the third substantiated complaint. 
if the property is primarily used on a seasonal basis, one year would obviously cover every season. The one year period should be shortened or lengthened by the town council in adopting this, but it is clearly a decision of the town council. So we, we took this under advisement as well. And we've been asked here tonight to possibly put some kind of sunset legislation on this thing by saying we will actually visit this formally one year from its implementation. And it would seem to me that with some history, some background data collection, and some, something to actually look upon as a decision, we could determine whether we wish to tighten up on those, on those uh, uh, three strikes you're out hardships. Well, Bottom line you, is, are you saying after a year we? we well, I, I think that what we've we've felt all along is that we've been responsive. We feel we've been responsive. It has 14 months in the making, but we're not going to just let this sort of just sit out there. I think if we have new information, we're going to come back in and revisit this. I think we've got a very active ordinance committee here. That's that, and the new ordinance uh, committee, I believe, is it's made up of obviously two of the existing ordinance committee. But the fact of the matter is that Tom didn't feel we should tighten up on that any further. He also felt that there's enough detail in what it is that would become or be viewed as a substantiated issue in this ordinance. Those are going to be the sort of column of the, the, the parameters, the, you know, the guardrails, whatever, that we're going to measure the substantiation. But his feeling was we, wouldn't, <clears throat> we shouldn't be doing that now. So I actually agree with the people who say that, that, that the, the person signing the lease should be the owner and that we need to get these people cranking out business that, that are just using it clearly as a business, <laughs> running the risk of even buying a property to run as a business. But I, I will defer to, I'm not gonna, I mean, I, I, I would like to know what the rest of the council thinks because mm -hmm. I would also be okay with letting a year pass. I'd like the suggestion that in a year we formally say we'll mm -hmm. review it. And if it continues to be a big problem, as it is right now, actually not in one property but several right. properties, then that should be revisited. But if but if a majority of people agree with me that we should that we should insert the language right now, I, I'd be happy to do it. So what are other people's yeah. feelings? Well, I, I and, and basically, I mean, the conversation would. I mean, I, we can also bring Maureen up here. She was in, in the same meeting with Tom. But I mean, again, he goes back to you know where. We're, we're, we're regulating what's taking place in this property. Not the thing. Not, I not the landlord or his agent. What, what do other people think? So. Okay. I, uh, since I will be still on the council and still on the ordinance committee next year <coughs> as well as the year after, um, I, I am fully committed <laughs> to reviewing this ordinance within a year, within a year's time, and we can revisit the subletting issue. I, I, my view is I'd like to get this in place, see how it works, and if all of a sudden we have a rash of uh, companies that are now sublessing short-term rentals across the town of Cape Elizabeth, we can revisit the issue. Um, I think this is a compromise. I really appreciate the uh, uh, folks who have spoken both for and against this ordinance. Um, and I also just want to thank the planning board uh, for the tremendous amount of work that it put into this as well. Uh, they really did a lot of good things to make this ordinance uh, frankly make more sense. Um, and just in response to the one in the comments, I, I don't think we have to worry about people making false claims of violations. Uh, the, the folks who have been affected by this have largely been reluctant to make complaints. Uh, and I've heard from a number of these folks who are not going to do something, uh, report something that's trivial. Um, it, we have to just have to trust in people to be good neighbors and responsible citizens, and, and to me, that's what this yeah. ordinance is all about. Well, in, 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 in Sarah, if I, my, the reason for bringing up what Tom had given to us is that we heard these very issues that were brought again to us tonight, and we did pursue them. We did vet them with our attorney. But again, this is, uh, you know, again, this is like I've said before, this is brand new territory for us, and, and I, we want to get it right and there's absolutely no reason for us not to. And so I just want, I just especially want the people that brought this to our attention, three citizens last time, that it didn't fall on deaf ears, that it was actually pursued. So <coughs> other people want to weigh in? Right. The only comment I have is really a question. Um, one of the um, 
uh, comments was that the notification period <coughs> can delay uh, notification to the owner up to one week, which would create a difficulty in terms of responding and not getting a violation and being able to go after the renter who did the violation. Do you have any response to that? I mean, it seems like an issue. Is it? Is it, do you think it's an issue? I mean, well, it was an implementation issue. I, I'm, I'm not sure we. I mean, we we talked. We've got the chief of police here as well. Um, I think we felt that that timeline could be up to a week, but we also were a lot clearer about who we were calling. We needed accurate, you know, phone numbers to get in touch with people, and it was there was going to be some timeline in terms of notification to get into properties and all that. Um, so I I don't I don't see that as an issue, but again, on, as a practical matter. Um, the administration of it is something that, you know, uh, Michael and uh, our whatever our new code enforcement officer um, are going to have to to work with. But clearly, time is of the essence, um, and uh, I think we all understand that. I just, from a practical matter, I I don't know. I'd, I'd leave that to the administration of the town. Thoughts, Michael? Any? <clears throat> yeah, uh, yes, I would agree. You know, the, the important thing is I think everyone wants a prompt response to complaints. They want a, a prompt response to issues and concerns. And folks that are accused of something want a, a prompt resolution as well. And that's what we'll endeavor to do. Caitlin? Just while we're talking about this notification issue, I don't think either one of those responses really addresses the issue that was brought up. I mean, it says in here that you're going to receive within five days the police report of a complaint. So how come we can't come up with something that will implement when the police are called and they go there and they find something substantial? We're collecting all this information and phone numbers and I'm sure every landlord's gonna have to give a cell phone, a daytime, a nighttime phone number. They should be able to receive a phone call. I mean, if the police showed up at a 16-year-old party, they would find the homeowner and call him, right? So, I mean, she made a very good point that what if they have a party on the sixth night of their seven-day rental, which is another issue I want to talk about, but she gets notified five days later, they're gone. Her contract's expired. She has no recourse to go after them. It could be her third strike and no way to go after the, the family or whoever just ruined her short-term rental permit. So I think we, we do need to work and look at that a little more. And I'd love to hear what the chief has to say about how hard it would be to notify them a little more promptly. Well, I think I think the language in here is is premised on the notion that the owner is not going to be notified of a violation until it's really substantiated. But I think, as Caitlin said, why not have a call go to the owner when the complaint comes in, whether or not it's substantiated or not? It's a notification. It gives them an opportunity to get involved right up front if they want to get involved. But I, I, <clears throat> Neil. I'm just assuming that, like you always do, you're going to show up as soon as the call's made and you're going to cope with it. Uh, my impression of this five-day thing was a formal report. I, I just would assume you'd show up and you would contact the owner of the house, or am I wrong? The uh, people on the ordinance committee can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that notification was uh, commented on by Bruce. Bruce said, if I'm on days off, I need some time to look at the complaint when I come back, and then I'll notify the owner, so give me five days. I think that's what that was all about. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. As far as the police department goes, if we have a list of who's on the short-term rental and the owners and their addresses and stuff, um, normally, yes, I think we can call them. Will one or two slip through the cracks at some point? That's a, a first time. I mean, we know about Lawson Road. Do we know about Peebles Cove? Do we know about any place else? Maybe not. If we don't, if we go to the residence and you know there's a noise complaint and we go there and we handle it, and we don't know it's a short short term rental, will the owner get notified? Probably not. But I mean, once we go to that residence once we're going to know that it's a short-term rental or once we get notified and then it'll be on our radar and yes i would think that we could notify them at 11 o'clock at night if we can get their cell phone but you know this is new to us also um and so we would we would definitely work with it but 
as far as that notification on the five days, I think that was more from the code enforcement, not from the police department. Th thank you. I think there's probably a simple solution to this. To the extent to which the owners are concerned about this delay and the extent to which the police may not know it's a short-term rental, the owners can notify you up front that they want to be notified of a problem, and you guys would have the number, and you'd know to call immediately, right? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Just, if, if my, I want to make clear, if you, if you look at the language in the ordinance, it's not the police department's five days. It's the five days for the code enforcement officer actually to check out if any of the provisions are substantiated. It's not just as a result of a call. It's any provision of the short-term rental ordinance, which includes a whole, you know, a whole host of right. different issues. And that's correct. And um, uh, the lady that spoke um, about being notified, I mean, we would gladly notify them right off, off the bat if, if, and if it clicks in that we know it's a short-term rental. I mean, you know, what we want to do is we want to solve the problem. We don't want to go back there three times at night. We don't want the neighbors to be calling us. We don't. We want them to, you know, have their peace. So um, we'll work with it and we'll do do the best we can. Thank you. Okay. So I have a suggestion. We could sit here and discuss this. I'm sure for till midnight because we have discussed this now for, I don't know, like two years. So why don't we vote? So we get this going. Um, it seems like the time has come because there's lots of little things we can we can call out here But basically I think we've all agreed as the people have said this is a compromise for everyone No one's gonna be perfectly happy which probably means it's pretty good and then why don't we make a commitment? You guys make a commitment to watch this over the course of a year and revisit it and take notes and keep a folder and and in exactly a year's time or maybe ten months so you can come out in a year tweak it is, is that something that feels okay? Because we really could sit here for another hour tweaking this, but we've all agreed that we don't like rewriting ordinances on the fly up here. It's really generally not a good idea. And the Ordinance Committee has done an unbelievable job. Sarah, just to, and maybe, sorry, Caitlin, just as a clarification, um, and this would be for you, Michael, could, could that, my, um, my motion be amended to include a review by the Ordinance Committee um, one year from now? As a, as a formal part of accepting this ordinance. I mean, that way, I think we've heard it from more than one citizen tonight. We got a letter from a citizen who didn't speak this evening, and that was the recommendation. So, I mean, I, I don't know how, to, how do people feel. Is that a possibility, Michael? If, if the council wants to, you know, you're, you're adopting the ordinance, and that is not changing the ordinance. Yes. That's not being required in the ordinance. Right. But if you, as, as part of your, you know, you, the whereas, or you could, you could always add an instruction to it, uh, simply saying, and whereas the council has agreed to review uh, this issue uh, on or about December 2013, uh, I think it would cover it. Uh, who, who seconded the motion? Frank. 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 Okay. So, would he have to accept that? Do you agree with that? I agree with that. Can, the, can this be reflected in the... Minutes we adopt next month, so it reads that. Whatever you approve will be reflected. Yes. Jessica? Uh, I think that's a, a good idea for a couple of reasons. Um, I think that the uh, Ordinance Committee has done an incredible job. This is a very difficult issue. And as much as I sympathize with the, the Lawson Road neighborhood, I also have heard from so many people all throughout the town that have no difficulties and are worried about undue regulation. So reviewing this in a year also gives those individuals in town who are not wanting this ordinance to be enacted, who see this as burdensome, they will then have an opportunity to bring those concerns forward should they have them. Mm -hmm. Caitlin? That's essentially what I was going to say is that hopefully this does pass with this review in a year. We can also keep in mind, you know, repealing it. I mean, I understand the need for some regulation, looking at getting on record. But there's a difference between gathering information so that you can notify people and restricting property rights. I mean, I really don't think limiting the number of guests in a house, the days of rental, which is really the restrictive part on the property rights of these homeowners, is going to help <coughs> the, the noise ordinances that are already on the books. So you can make as many phone calls as you want 
to complain about the rules that we already have, these things are just restrictive to the property owners in town. They shouldn't have to be faced with, you know, if they have a house with five bedrooms, they can only have eight people stay in it. It just seems ridiculous. And so, you know, it's an overreaching fix is what I think we're putting on the town right now. Remember, it's only for certain size properties. Okay, so. Yes, but, okay, so but only for a certain size properties. You, so your 30,000 square feet limits the eight people, but everybody is limited by the days. Well, every property is limited to a seven-day rental, and it has to be seven days, and they can't be, they can't be consecutive rentals. So you have to go Saturday to Saturday, and then Sunday to Sunday. You can't, it, it really is restrictive. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, whether you have 30,000 square feet or 8,000 square feet, the fact that you can only rent your home seven days at a time is restrictive on property rights. So, okay, so let's vote and do you want, do you, we will take that. Sarah, can, yeah. can we ask Maureen to come up here for a second and just ask a question about what Caitlin just talked no, about? No, I think we're good. Uh, no, Caitlin, I think in a year, all these on both so, sides, we can, we're, we're going to start taking that, start taking the notes for the folder right now. <laughs> okay. We're not going to change the ordinance. That's right, your chair. Based on this. So <laughs> why don't we vote? Well, I, I think the point is just to allow Maureen to clarify what Caitlin said, because yeah, I'm not sure I, I just, it's entirely okay. accurate. Yeah, I just want to, I want to clarify that. And okay. right. I just don't want to generate an hour No, no, it's okay. Just, we have a long... Easy, but there are house lots that are that yeah. small before we started it, having zoning issues. Right. Right now, you can only have it to be 30,000 or whatever, close to that square feet. But there are lots in town that are small that could rent, that would be restricted to this. I didn't want you to come to a meeting and not speak. Hi, Maureen. I was okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> if you could just ask your questions again, please. I didn't have a question. Okay. My, my question is, Thank you. do these rules apply to only the lots that are 30,000 square feet or less? or all short term, all properties that are rented at down? The provisions you're considering tonight can regulate anyone who has a dwelling that they're trying to rent for less than 30 days. And then for properties that are trying to rent and the lot size is less than 30,000 square feet, there are some additional provisions. But everyone, if you're owning, if you own a property and you're gonna rent for a period of less than 30 days and you're gonna rent for two weeks only, then you don't have to get a permit. If you're renting for two weeks and one day, then you're going to have to get a short-term rental permit. Right. Okay. But, so I understand the permit requirement kicks mm -hmm. in, but most of the restrictions that were part of this draft ordinance or proposed <coughs> ordinance relate to those lots that are less than a certain amount of square footage. I, I hate to disagree with you, Councillor okay. Sherman, but right. most of the provisions apply to everyone. Okay. Everyone has to get a permit. Everyone has to do the building code stuff. Everyone has to show that they have parking. Everyone has to show they have adequate subsurface disposal or connection to the public sewer. No, I understand that. Right. But what about the, the durational limits? Right. And the, the limit on um, whether you can rent for less than a seven-day period, that applies to everyone. Now, you can rent for a four-day period. Right. But then, as you've said, the, the other three days of that week, you have to be dark. Um, I know there are people who rent, their, their, money, their money period is July and August. And then they have times when they can rent for long weekends. And you could rent from Friday to Monday. You could still do that. It's just that in a seven-day period, you can only have one tenant. So you could rent from a Monday to, a, to, let's say you rented from a Friday to a Monday, and then you wouldn't be able to rent it again until the following Friday. Um, so you're not, you're not stuck to a Saturday to Sunday schedule. Um, you can vary that. But you could also, could one rent uh, to, for a two week period? Yes, oh yes, you could rent for a two week period. And you could rent for more than 30 days, and then you're completely out of this ordinance altogether. Okay, 31. Maureen, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to move the question, if that's okay. All those in favor of the ordinance? Opposed? Thank you. Second milestone tonight.
Moving on. God damn it. I feel like we're, I feel like we're leaving a family. We're being abandoned. Yeah, we're being abandoned by the family. You don't have the ordinance committee to kick around anymore. Oh my goodness. I should have gone on that. This was a good year. It was a good year. <laughs> no way. Okay, we're going to keep moving. We have another public hearing um, on the proposed amendments for the solid waste ordinance. So I would like to open that public hearing now. Um, anyone who wishes to speak to this can come forward to the microphone. Seeing no one who wants to speak to that, I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion uh, for item 131. I, I move that the Town Council hereby enact the attached proposal, um, Solid Waste Ordinance Amendments. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Uh, okay. Um, item 133, Future Open Space Committee Final Report. <coughs> Thank you so much. Do we have a motion? Jessica? Uh, I move that we receive the final report of the Future Open Space Committee with appreciation to the committee and, its and to its staff and, and uh, we, what am I doing? Uh, and we uh, refer the, rep the report to a future town council workshop for review and discussion. <coughs> Second. Discussion? I think John's here to uh, speak about it, Sarah. Oh, good. John Green, the chairman of the committee. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is John Green, obviously. I'm chair of the committee and uh, representative of the Cape Farm Alliance. Um, on behalf of the committee, I'm pleased to present you with your final report. You, the council, appointed an 11-member committee and charged it with a series of tasks to quantify town open space needs and thoroughly examine ways to meet those needs. Future open space preservation Preservation Committee met 30 times, including nine meetings by subcommittees and included a public forum. The committee posted all meeting agendas and meeting materials on the town website and provided an opportunity for public comment at every meeting. Updates on the committee's progress were posted on the town website and published in the Cape Courier. The committee also conducted a telephone survey to gauge public support for open space and methods for future preservation. I'd like to thank the uh, committee members for their effort and dedication throughout the process. Um, that included Richard Bauman, Conservation Commission, Wayne Brooking, Citizen, Craig Cooper, Citizen, Chris Franklin, Cape Elizabeth Land Trust Representative, Frank Governale of the Town Council, Caitlin Jordan of the Town Council, Carol Ann Jordan, a planning board representative, Bo Norris, citizen, Jessica Sullivan, town council representative, and staff support with Maureen O'Meara, who did a Herculean task of holding this all together throughout this uh, lengthy process. Uh, we look forward to the council's review of this report and hope it provides a town with guidance in open space preservation. Thank you. John, thank you so much for chairing it. Um, I have a present. It's a bound copy of the study, and it's quite impressive in its length. So thank it looks you. like it was an enormous amount of work. Um, and thank you to our three committee members and everyone else uh, who was on the committee. I know it was lots and lots and lots of time and meetings. Um, well, was, I'd just like to say it was, it was a, a lot of work, and the, um, the, uh, the, the bulk of that work was carried by, by John and Maureen, keeping us going, keeping us on task, and making sure we got what we needed to do to get done. And I think they did a great job in listening to input from the entire committee and incorporating it into the uh, report. And that's what the objective was, to get uh, diverse viewpoints on this. So I think
think it was a good outcome. Other comments? Okay, with gratitude, uh, all those in favor? Thank you. And thank you, Maureen. Uh, Fort Williams Park Group use fee. Is there a motion? Item 134. Frank? Uh, move to um, uh, accept the recommendation of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee for uh, adjustments to the uh, group use fees as detailed in the uh, our packets. Second. Discussion? Good question. Yeah. The yeah. commercial photography, main base companies and other companies, is that like just your regular photographer wants to come in and take a family portrait at, at the park or? It, we, usually if it's just a simple photo like that, they, they just come in, they do it, there's not an issue. I mean like if you hire. This, this is when they come in with, with vans of equipment and do a, a major shoot. Yeah. Um, in all the price changes, Mike, that, that one was the only one where sort of a structural change, um, breaking it down into more detail. And I'm wondering if that, the reason for that, and, and is it expected to produce more revenue as a result? I think, I think it's that, Frank, and also more clarity. Uh, you know, there's, there's always a little bit of uncertainty on, on, on that particular fee, and it, you know, I think it's still a work in progress. Yeah, I think that, that that's exactly right. That was the, the issue is more clarity, especially when they get calls to they, they have more exacting information for whoever it is that's pursuing this. The thing that's missing from this, you're, you're missing the, the, um, uh, the bus uh, fees as well as uh, concessions, and the uh, advisory at Michael's recommendation is going to take that up at its next meeting and have an update for you on that. They, they had kind of kept the two separate from one another. They really needed to be bundled into one report to us. But uh, because it's so new, they uh, were treating it two separately. Uh, Jim, do you mean a, a report for what the fees should be this they, year or yeah, an overall for assessment? For next year's fees. Fees. Both. Both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. And, and a review of how it went this year. Yeah, pretty much. But they separated the two, unfortunately, and it should have come out in this report. And, and it's okay. So it's directional. So. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Uh, item 135, the driveway easement. Uh, do we have a motion? You ever do a little intro? Yeah. yeah. And I was, I see Mike is here, so I was maybe going to have him. Do, Mike, do you want to introduce this? And then we'll have I'll do a brief introduction. Yeah, the, the Concannons are here who own this property at 349 Ocean House Road. I think you, you do now own it. Yes, they, they do now own it. Uh, this is the, the, the property right as you're looking at the high school driveway on the left. Uh, earlier the, earlier uh, in Jan this year in January, the town council granted an easement uh, to the property owner uh, in exchange for $5,000 that's going to be credited to the school department. And the, the motion that when the council adopted it said that you were, you were granting the access easement it was unclear if it was to both en for entrance and exit. Uh, the, the thinking of the, the exit is it gets people to exit out on to the traffic, to go out by the traffic light. Uh, the planning board, you know, separately would review any proposal to see the safety of all these issues, but the owner of the property would like uh, the, the ability within the easement to have both entrance and exit. Uh, and I would agree that that's appropriate uh, and it, it, in the long run for the community will be a lot easier to, to manage the easement. Uh, so I, you know, I would have no objection to the council clarifying it and indicating that when Tom Lee, he drafts the document, it, it will allow both uh, entrance and exit, but again, underlining it's up to the planning board as part of site plan review to determine uh, what will be allowed for entrance and exit. Mike, do you want us to come up? And let's pick up all questions. Okay, you, let's start with the motion. Do you, will you make a motion? Yeah, I mean, that clarification is very helpful. So I would make a motion uh, that we clarify that the yeah. easement to be granted by the town to the owner of 349 Ocean House Road 
under the high school driveway we, would be for both uh, entering and exiting the property. Seconded. Uh, I have a, do you have a question? I was just going to second. Oh, sorry. I have a question. So are both the entrances and exits you're looking at to be two-way? Correct. Yeah. So people, how are you going to manage that, like, within your property? That there'll be, someone can come in, park, and go out the other way, or they could p go out the same way? It's sort of their decision? It's their decision, correct. Um, and so when the, I mean, the only time of the day this is going to be an issue at all is the 10 or 15 minutes when the high school's starting. And correct. the 10 or 15 minutes when it's ending, which is utter and complete mm -hmm. mayhem. Right. Um, so are you just assuming that patrons will, sensing that they're taking uh, their life in their hands, will go the other way? or? How? Yeah, I think we did a, Tom Gorrell will be at the planning meeting next week, the planning board meeting, and he, d he was there at those times, and I think he found, you're right, in the morning, there are, it seems a little that from almost 7.50 to 8 o'clock, it seems a little busy, but... He says there are pockets where if people are coming in off Ocean Ave or Ocean House Road parking and then want to take the left towards the high school, there are periods that they can take the left. Tom Gorrell is a traffic engineer. Traffic engineer, I'm sorry. And I just have one other question. Um, the kids who will be flocking in there to purchase their breakfast um, will be all walking. So is there going to be a safe way for them to not get tangled up with the cars going in and out? Yeah, uh, there's a, um, there, uh, yeah. Okay. There is, as of now. I, I are not know he's, cutting across the parking no, lot. He, I think they some... built, he has planned, uh, John Mitchell, to put a speed bump in and right at that area as well. So, yeah. I think Sir, I, I actually see a, a great new job for you is to go under the planning board and then Absolutely. you can play. I thought you were going to say to serve coffee in the morning. I was like, uh, yes, that's me. That's my next job. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. make muffins at Mike's new store. Right. Frank? I was simply going to say, since the planning board is going to review this, yeah. um, I feel very comfortable passing I do, too. Yeah. I just was trying to visualize yeah. the... Is there an opening on the planning board? <laughs> <laughs> Zoning board appeals. I would like that. It's kind of like never... it's interviewing Tarna. It's yeah. detailed. Just it's detailed if, work. If, if I might say, I, I had a chance meeting with Maureen and others to look at the plans, and you know, the, the planning board will ultimately determine it, but it, it looks like it'll be a great addition to the community. And it's also good, it's a continued implementation of the town center plan in that we, it'll be continuing the sidewalk along that side of Route 77 in front of this property. It also is going to be a two-story structure that will have a gourmet market in the, the first floor, and the second floor will also be occupied by uh, the Concannon's printing business, uh, where they don't actually do printing, but they, they process print orders. Just uh, office space. Office space, office so it uh, should be a, a nice addition to the town. Uh, overall, and yep. I would wish them well as they go through the planning board process. Well, right. I'm excited. I know Stephanie will oversee the healthy snacks and drinks for the high school kids. <laughs> no caffeine, no sugar. Okay, any other discussions? We're taking liberty at the last meeting. Wow. <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Item 136, Proposed Capital <clears throat> Improvement Planning Committee. Sure. Mike. Yes, uh, as a result of uh, discussions involving uh, the capital needs study, which is uh, or the facility needs study, which is your next item on the agenda, and as well as the, 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 the sense that we ought to be looking comprehensively at capital improvement planning committee, I had suggested initially, I believe, that, that we set up a committee made up of a couple of counselors, a couple of school board members, to uh, to look at to look at uh, our capital project needs. Uh, and to come up with a 10-year capital improvement plan. Uh, subsequently, uh, Frank Govanali and Michael Moore uh, came up with a, a draft. That this is substantially, and I've made a couple of minor changes. But, uh, you know, I think this is, th this will be good in keeping with the one town concept. And it, it also, I think citizens expect us to look at all the different needs and to prioritize them. Uh, you know, there's, you know, obviously there was some, there's some fallout after the library issue. Uh, you know, admittedly, and you know, and this will be the beginnings of a forum to help to resolve some of those issues and to, to move them forward and to look at all of our capital needs. I, I do think, uh, you know, there's lots of messages and votes and, you know, people vote for and against things for different reasons and 
you know, one of the criticisms labeled falsely, I believe, was that we hadn't done capital planning. And, you know, while there had been a lot of planning, there had been uh, a lot of activity, you know, it, it, it doesn't hurt to have some of the, all the key parties at the table to, to review them. And uh, I think, you know, this in substantially this form uh, should go forward. We have a motion. Before that, I just have a question for the group. Um, it, when we put together the FOSS standard operating, you know, expectations or whatever, should we be doing this in a workshop so we can delve into this a little more detail and, and really have a handle on exactly what it is we're designing here for their charge? Because it it's um, <clears throat> I, you know, I just I want to make sure that this is a balanced view. Um, what took place, you talked about the fallout, what took place in the last couple of weeks with this report really gives me pause to say we need to be real clear as to what the purpose of this group is going forward. And it's makeup. And if it's makeup, there's only going to be two members from this board. You know, I just want to make sure we understand what their roles and responsibilities are. But I also feel like we have all these department heads in this town. And if they're going to be considered part of this ex officio, or are they going to be just resources that are being utilized on a, on a basis when we're evaluating that particular part of the business? I don't know. I mean, I, I just feel like I'm not, I'm not prepared at this moment to agree to this. I'd like to study it further, and I'd like to maybe have a workshop so we can have some dialogue around it. Maybe there's the possibility of doing that in a joint workshop with the board that we're going to be working with here, and that's the school board. I just, I just feel like, you know, I'd like to have a little more conversation around what we're doing and why we're doing it, and how this report's going to be used in that process. So. Okay. <clears throat> um, I guess why, where I look at it, Jim, is that the keeping this charge pretty simple and straightforward is a good way to, it's an advisory board, you know that, without any, um, any actual uh, responsibility or authority to enforce the recommendations. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, and unlike FOSS, which had a, a sunset mm -hmm. and a specific report that was going to be coming out at a specific period of time on a very specific top subject, this is, this is sort of, an, seems to me, an open um, and probably evolving committee that will um, probably change over time in terms of uh, the role it serves, in terms of making recommendations and investigating <coughs> uh, capital requirements. Uh, so. I mean, I don't think there's any problem with having a, um, a, you know, a workshop on it, but I just wonder if that's sort of overkill given um, what we're trying to achieve with this. Uh, and I think, you know, I think the word Mike used, which is forum, is, is probably the most apt description of what this is. This is an opportunity to collect data on, a, on an ongoing basis, filter it through, um, you know, the, the committee as well as uh, department heads and so forth, <coughs> coming up with a recommendation. Um, being burdened down, I think being burdened by a lot of specific concrete requirements um, may make it more difficult to operate. Now, I, I wouldn't object to it, but I just, I'm not sure if it's necessary. Well, one of the conversations that had surfaced, whether informally or otherwise, was this possibility of a structural change to the capital, that we would take capital expenditures out of the municipal budget, out of the school budget, and carry it as a separate mm -hmm. line. So, I mean, that kind of structural change you know, I, I, I feel like if we're going to go there, I want to be clear about that. That's all. I, that's that's all. That was the reporting recommendation. The legal responsibilities yeah. always reside with the town. And the, yeah. and the authority for setting capital planning resides with the existing board, existing right. council and, and board. I mean, I think that the, the, the critical piece is what is going to be done with it when it's done. I think if this committee were charged with any kind of implementation, that would be a big problem. I see this as just like the first step in sure. this conversation where they, maybe there should be a timeline on it, but you know, I don't think they should belabor this forever. I think they should just sort through this massive amount of information, distill it and present it to then the council and the school board for more vetting. So if we keep it simple and we don't go to a workshop, I mean then I'd like to have another person on it. I'd like to have three from this board and three from the other board, have both, both finance chairs from both boards and have two members from this board. Um, just to have three people with Michael, having the school superintendent and three people, having eight 
I mean, I just, you know, if it's going to be simple, then it shouldn't be a problem to add another person to it. I just think it's so important to us. It became so important to the citizens in the last couple of weeks. I just want to make sure it gets fully vetted and reviewed by the best minds available from our elected officials. So that's where I'm going. I wouldn't object to workshop for one. I just didn't think it was necessary. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'd like to see it go to a workshop. I mean, this looks like an ad hoc committee to me. It's not a, you know, a standing board or commission. And in the past, when we've developed something like this, we've discussed the committee makeup and we've discussed the scope of work and so forth in a workshop so that we all weigh in. And we haven't all weighed in. I mean, I certainly haven't. I don't know who else has weighed in on this besides what Frank has already reported to us. I mean, it's when I read this committee responsibility, it's pretty far reaching. I'm wondering if we need to have, you know, public works director. I mean, we're going to be looking at all kinds of things here with this. I mean, I think we need to talk about it. I think we need to talk about who else needs to be uh, at the table, what are the, who the other stakeholders may be. Um, this is pretty far reaching, um, and I, I think it it behooves us all to really hash this out and get more detail. I'd be far more comfortable going forward if we at least had one workshop to talk about it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's fine. For, I, I think it's important that the, the bodies, the elected bodies, be comfortable with this as it moves forward. It's radically different from what we're doing. You know, overall, I think it's a good, good process. Uh, who, who, how many counselors are on it, how many school board members, obviously, you can have discussion and de debate on that as well as other issues. You know, the, the staff issue, you know, I, I really think that all of the staff, other than the superintendent manager, should be resources. I don't think they all ought to be ex-officio. There's just a, you know, we, we had a little bit of discussion on that in the draft that, uh, you know, ultimately, is, you know, is, is this indicates you know, ultimately, it's the superintendent and the manager who propose budgets. It's ultimately the two boards that do them. And, you know, for, for that reason, you know, I, I, I think the role of the staff also needs to be within the proper framework of what the role of the staff usually is in the entire budget process, which, which is input into it. And then, uh, and then the roles of the manager, superintendent, and the school board, and the council are, are already defined. So I think a workshop's fine, and if, if you do, I'd really encourage you to do it at the December meeting, because you know this is something that I, I do believe is important to be done, needs to be done, and uh, you know there's there's, uh, there's a lot of questions of how we do capital improvement planning, and I think the the more that people understand and know, and you know I think the better the better off uh, uh, citizens can make informed decisions on any budget question or any issue of informed comments. Frank? Um, if we go that route, would it be a good idea, do you think, to um, have a joint workshop with the school boards so we're all on the same page in terms of understanding what the role is and, and um, you know, how we're going to proceed going forward? Could certainly, I would certainly yeah, get us yeah. started on the right foot. <laughs> it could be. A, I mean, you've worked with Michael, yeah. um, and I know Sarah's worked with Mary. I, I clear this one town concept. I mean, we clearly want to continue that momentum. No one wants to stop that. So if we do do a workshop, that would be a separate workshop than what, what you're talking about, Michael. It, it probably would if you did. You know, usually around the first of the year, you have a workshop with the board anyway, and this might be a good topic. And, you know, it, I don't know if they've organized their offices yet for next year like the council has, but probably do it. In that case, probably not. You do have your own workshop in December on other issues, and you'd probably discuss this with them uh, in early January after they've organized. I'm Thanks. comfortable with the charge as drafted. I'm comfortable with two members from each body serving, but I'm also fine having a workshop, and I agree if we do, it should be with the school board. I think we should continue to sort of move this ball forward together and not be meeting separately to review any reports. Yeah, so I think if we met separately in advance, we would end up sort of having our own conclusions, presenting it to right. them, right. as opposed to coming right. uh, together with one conclusion. So do we need to make a motion that sends this to a workshop? Or do we just, I've got a question, has the school board reviewed this already? I believe all they've done is, um, I don't think formally. I think no, they've no. just considered who might be on it. 
which I'm not even sure that they've, they've settled on. I know one school board member had a hand in drafting it, but I, I don't know to what extent it's gone to the full board. So can we propose a uh, workshop and invite the school board to participate? Yeah. Is your December uh, workshop already filled up with items? Well, you get council goals, which sometimes takes a while, and there's a, there's a you know, you just a couple of other things referred to workshops, so, uh, you know, what I planned, I sent out a, an outline of what you might have discussed at your December workshop. There were four or five items, and, you know, usually a, the plan would be for that workshop, even though it's before the council seated, I would speak with the, the incoming chair to, to come up with an agenda. So I, just a suggestion, why don't you set it for very early January and let the school board know so they can get it on their calendars and just have yeah. it be a joint workshop where you talk about this and any other issues that might be relevant to both boards. That's, I'll talk to uh, uh, the superintendent of schools tomorrow and then she can reach out to her board leadership and then, mm -hmm. I'll, then we'll circle back with, with Jim about uh, some dates and with the council. So do you need a formal... Do we need to make a motion or do we just keep going? Well, you, you ought to dispose of the item some way on the agenda. Uh, do we need to... Refer to workshop, I think, would be. Before I make a tabling motion, uh, I mean, because we have a motion now to approve this charge and it's been seconded. Uh, are, are we, do we need to simply have an amended motion to replace what's on the table? If I might help you through this, I yes, just suggest you. you refer to a workshop okay. uh, per, per the discussion of this evening. So let's have that be a motion and a second that we vote on that we're referring it to workshop. Is someone? So, so Frank made the motion, right? Dave. Uh, did I'm, I'm not. We I didn't have a motion. motion was made. We well, didn't. We no, didn't because we started with discussion. Your, your okay. Yeah. Good. So Good. let's have a motion that just puts this at a workshop. Do, do you want to? Take I that move that we uh, uh, refer the issue of the capital improvement planning committee. To a workshop, a joint workshop, if the school board is available and willing, uh, in uh, January of 2013, or at a mutually agreeable date. Seconded. All those in favor? Okay, good. Thank you, Jim. Um, item 137, the facility study report. Should we start with a motion? we receive the facility studies report we've already referred re well I, I, and refer this to we need to the same workshop to, okay yeah to the same workshop so the same workshop so I, I I move we receive the facility study report and refer it to a future work council workshop second discussion all those in favor I don't want I'm, glad it, I'm glad it's being received. Okay. I am glad it's formally. Being received. It's a good thing. Because it sounded like it was received formally <laughs> in the community before today. Item 138, personnel code amendment, section 125 plan limits. Uh, Mike, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, the, this, there are specific limits that are stated in our personnel code that will no longer be able to be effective January 1 as a result of. Uh, changes in, in federal code, so this would just bring it into conformance uh, with federal code. The proposed amendment, so it's proposed you schedule a public hearing for next month on that. Yeah. I move that we set a public hearing on Monday, December 10, 2012, at 7 p.m. on the proposed amendments to the personnel code relating <coughs> to new federal regulations limiting Section 125 deferrals. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Item 139, General Assistance Annual Updates. Deborah, do you want to say anything? Um, this is just your annual um, review of the General Assistance Updates, and that would be in order for the Council to hold a public hearing on Monday, December 10th. Okay. I move we uh, set a public hearing for the General Assistance Annual Update for Monday, December 10th, 2012, at 7 p.m. at our for, I guess, updates into the appendices in the general assistance ordinance. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? 
Item 140, Project Canopy Grant Application. We have a motion. Jessica? I move that we uh, authorize a grant application for a Project Canopy Grant. Second. Discussion? What, 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 is it, what kind of trees are we trying to preserve and promote? I had never. It's the hickory. It's a hickory. Yeah. Okay. Hickory. hickory. Shad, 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 bark. Bark. Yeah. shad bark hickory. We have some beautiful ones up by the Gulf Crest Field yeah. which are going in the road there on the, on the right. They're beautiful tree. And apparently it was really, uh, there were tons of them in Cape Elizabeth years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not so many now, so this is a great opportunity to start planting more of them again. What uh, caused them to? Development. Yeah. Uh, okay, all those in favor? Item 141, main right to know law update. Yeah, uh, just you, you need to appoint a local public information officer to be responsible for adherence to requests for public information. It's usually the clerk or the manager. I have to, do, you, do you want to do this, Deb, or do you want me to do it? Uh, either way, whatever the wish of the council is. <laughs> Whoa. Either one. Either one. I, I'd recommend the clerk be appointed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Basically, under, under, the, under the state, the, the new state law, you need to appoint someone, and it's just the place the request comes into it. Since technically the custodian, the clerk is the keeper of all records, uh, is, is one of the responsibilities of clerks in the state. To me, that's where it really makes sense. Because most not. people put you on every email, yeah. really. You've most done this before, though, Deb, haven't you? Have you done this? Oh, with the other one. <laughs> yeah. And so you're very experienced. OK, so motion, Dave. I move that we appoint the town clerk I mentioned, not mention any, just the position as opposed to the individual. Okay, the town clerk to be responsible for adherence to requests for public information. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Um, and then we have one more item. Yes, we do. Could I introduce it and then see if they're willing to take up out of order? You may. Uh, you had before you a, a proposed lease to Treetops Capital. This is for space at the community center office building in the front, some of the upstairs office space. We had a, we had a residential tenant in there. This would be a, a small office. It would bring in $8,400 a year. The money goes to the community services budget. So uh, I ask that you authorize us to, to do a, a new lease, space that was previously leased. And we just have a new tenant. <clears throat> uh, do you need a motion on that? Do you want to? We need a motion to take to this suspend up. the rules to take it out of the way. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I move that we suspend the rules to take the, this uh, lease agreement out of order. Second. All those in favor? Okay. So just, now we need. Just if I might, this was my fault. Greg had, had given, had emailed this to me a couple weeks ago, and it got way, way down the email list. And when I was putting the agenda together, I missed it. So. I mean, is the other tenant out already? The other tenant is, is gone. So we should get someone in there. And this one, we, we, we cleared it with the other tenants. There was one, Edward Jones has a provision in their lease that we can't have similar business tenants, and this is not a similar business. We, we get approval from Edward Jones in St. Louis. I think that's great. Is there someone want to make a motion? Dave? Uh, I move that we authorize the town manager to sign on behalf of the town of Cape Elizabeth the commercial lease agreement with uh, Treetops Capital LLC. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, now is the time for citizens' opportunity for discussions with items not on the agenda, but seeing no one here, we will all entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Amen. You're still on the council to the second Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Please remind me. In case of an emergency. Now, when's that? Uh,